Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello, and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host, Craig, and I recently had the pleasure of chatting to director Suds Sutherland, who has directed episodes of Supergirl, The Flash, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Superman and Lois, and many more. We talk about learning the visual and narrative language of a TV show, relating to actors, being a fan who gets to direct, and so much more. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Suds Sutherland, who has directed episodes of The Flash, Superman and Lois, Batwoman, a bunch of other stuff. Welcome on. How are you doing? I'm great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Craig. Welcome. It's great to have you on and hear about your stuff. So let's just start talking about you. What made you get into the directing game and how did you get your start and what kind of led you to where you are now, really? I always was a kid who would read a lot, and and I started typing up stories on my mother's typewriter back in the days when we had typewriters. <laughs> so I just did that. I just wanted to write, and I always enlisted my friends to, let's make a play or let's do something on VHS or, or, or that kind of thing, like a lot of directors, I guess, embryonic directors in elementary school. And so I really enjoyed that. And so I kept on writing and I, I still do write. So I just never stopped. And so when I went to high school, I was trying to go for different plays and stuff like that. And always not getting the part. And then I was like, is this because I'm black? Is this, is this happening? Because it's like all these Victorian families on stage in my high school. And then there was a play called Raisin in the Sun, which was a play about a black family. So I thought, yes, this is me. I'm going to get this. I'm going to be totally in this. And then I didn't get a part. So I was like, oh, my God, I'm just a crap actor. I can't do this. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to write my own play. And so I wrote my own play, and I was going to cast myself in it. And then I was going to direct it. I gave it to the guy who was the best director in the school. I gave it to him, and he's like, "Uh, it's okay. It's pretty good for a black play. And I'm like, what do you mean black play? What are you talking about black play? I was like, ouch, what are you talking about? And I didn't have the words. I didn't know what to say, right? So I was like, oh, X you, man. F you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it myself. I'm going to direct it myself. I didn't know a thing about directing. So I got a couple books out of the library and just started to direct the play. <laughs> and so I just did that. And the play was successful. There was a theater competition and it did quite well. And that was the early encouragement that I needed to continue. So I went to York University in Toronto for a film. And I was there for three years. I dropped out of film school and then started working as a security guard slash PA and was writing and doing a lot of videos, short films, working on other people's films, being an editor, being an assistant director. I was just whatever I could to do stuff. And I just work a lot with my friends and, you know, friend of a friend of a friend. And then I started a film company with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, Jennifer Holness, was full disclosure, she's my business partner, writing partner, producing partner, and obviously the mother of our three daughters. So we have a full house and we got a little fluffy white dog as well named Shiloh. So we are a full house and it's like a mom and pop shop, but we are a small production company. And so I started off doing a lot of short films and we won the HBO Short Film Award with a short film that we did called My Father's Hands. And that really kind of put us on the map. And then that set me up for a feature film called Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones that won the best first feature at TIFF. And so that was a great experience. And I love doing feature films. And we also do documentaries. And so we kind of hopscotch between the two, docs and feature films, and also TV series. So I do a lot of dramatic series, written dramatic series, as well as direct them. I like to work on it all. I like working with actors. I like working with the writers. And I also like working with other directors, like hiring them and and working with them too. Because I've been a producer director as well. So I like working. (laughs) And I was a comic book fan from when I was a very little kid. I had a cousin named Sean who was like really into comic books. And he kind of inspired me to get comic books. So he turned me on to it. And so I've always collected comic books. And so that also led me to genre. I always wanted to do, like once the Arrowverse was announced, I I was really like trying to get down there, trying to get down to LA. I'm based in Toronto, trying to get down to LA and and say, hey, coach, put me in, put me in. And it was really tough to get it. When Arrow was announced, when Flash was announced, because Flash was the first spinoff of Arrow, I was like, "Mm, 
put me in coach, put me in. And they're like, yeah, yeah, great. You know, or yeah, we'll put you in. Yeah. Maybe one day, whatever. And that was like literally four years later, I get the call to do a flash. So I was very excited. And that was like my first stint into the Arrowverse. And it was fantastic. It was a great opportunity. And it was like flash with Amunet and and (laughs) gold face. It was great to do that one. And then they gave me a call back to do another one. And then, then once you're in that sort of world and they like what you do, then I got a call to do Batwoman. And then it became like this, oh, okay, you want to do another Flash? And then, oh, okay, let's do a Legends of Tomorrow, which is the next one that's going to come out next week. Legends of Tomorrow and, and okay, Supergirl. <laughs> it just sort of rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls. And so... I was able to get the call to do Superman and Lois, which was a couple of nights ago, 106, that aired. That was another fantastic opportunity, but I never thought that I would be able to just work with a character of Superman. Never thought that was going to happen because it was always reserved for feature films. Never thought that was going to happen. It was a real dream come true to work on it. And I think they're doing some fantastic stuff because I personally was very skeptical about a Superman show. I was like, we've seen it before, so many times before, so many iterations. I don't want to see another origin. I don't want to see another origin story of Superman. I don't want to go down there. You've got to do something new with this character. And obviously they did because it's definitely a family drama where his superpowers don't work. (laughs) cannot control a teenage boy with your superpowers. No, you can't just heat vision him or whatever. <laughs> That's what I find with Superman as well. The cinematic adaptations, it's all just the first few years of his career as Superman, whereas here we're way in. He knows what he's doing as Superman, but doesn't know quite what he's doing with his family. And that's the conflict and that's the drama. And that's what makes it interesting because it's just seeing him in a completely new light. And I love the show. I review it. It's always getting high marks for me. I I love the way it manages to juggle so many different plots every week. And I suppose as a director, that must be quite a challenge because you've got the teenage part, you've got the superpowered part, you've got the Lois and Clark relationship, you've got the town drama, you've got the corporate espionage side of it. It's spinning a lot of plates, that show. It really is. It is. It's a writing feat, and it's not easy to write those scripts, and they are a talented group of writers. And it's really something to watch and be part of, because to be on a first season of a show is really special. To be invited to that party, because that means they've got confidence in what you're doing, but they're trying to figure it out as it goes. But I thought that the show hit its stride in the beginning of the episodes, The first episode was like kind of an episode and a half. And Mm. it really sort of set the tone. In the first 15 minutes, there's a sort of a three-minute montage. I don't know if it's in fact three minutes, but it's the opening montage. And it really just sets the tone where there's a bit of nostalgia, but a bit of wistfulness and always a bit of hope and optimism. I think that's something, but it's also grounded in reality because you've got Jordan who's got this anxiety disorder. And that brings a lot of reality. And the, the young man who plays that, Alex Garfin, is fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, right. the, the cast of this is fantastic. Jordan Elsass and, and Alex Garfin play the two sons. Very, very, very sensitive actors and just a joy to be around. Very, very talented as well. Alex is also a very talented musician. They are really, really trying to break new ground. And I'm really glad that the writers and the network are very supportive of this because this is a whole new sort of phase two of CW in terms of experience because it's got a real cinematic quality to it. Yeah. It's fantastic. I really admire the work that they're doing on that show. That's a lot of comments that have come out early on about it is it looks way different from other out of air shows because of the way it's shot and the effects seem to be a bit better. They really aren't though, the way I've noticed it. They just kind of get used in a different way because obviously it's a TV budget. You look at Supergirl, sometimes it looks a bit cheap in terms of the CGI and whatever. And I guess that's always going to happen on TV. Whereas I think Superman deploys it in a different way that makes it maybe not stand out as much. They try to use the effects in a slightly different way. I'll tell you, those shows are not cheap. Like Supergirl yeah, is- I'm like, sure. That's, <laughs> like, that's a half a million dollars of effects. It's like, yeah. it's a lot. Like they do some really good work on that show. The lenses are different. So we're shooting anamorphic. These lenses are very idiosyncratic. You see like a lot of different flare patterns and they really want to play with the flares and <laughs> just experiment with it. And Lee Elder, the pilot director, was like, no, let's goof it up. Let's make it crazy. So they've got these lenses from the 70s like these ingenue lens from 70 and they're all very kind of one of a kind 
and they're just beautiful lenses with just real glass and you can feel the glass material you can see it it's a joy to work with when you're racking focus and you see the lens breathe it's giving a truly new cinematic quality to it. It feels very, very big budget. It is big budget. <laughs> it feels very, very big budget. But that's one thing as a filmmaker, when I see that, it's like, oh my gosh, like I feel like a kid again. But, you know, the filmmaker's saying, oh, look at this. It's a lot of fun to work with those kind of lenses. And when you come into a TV show, because you've done a lot of repeat work on TV, what's it like as a director coming into a show that has a house style? Because an episode of The Flash needs to be an episode of The Flash in terms of how it's set up. What's that like to kind of try and adapt to that style? And is the style similar across the out of our shows? Superman aside, of course, because that's a different thing. When you're adapting to a house style, one thing you have to do as a fan, because I'm a fan of all these shows, is that you have to watch all the episodes. Sometimes you get hired if the show's in its fifth season. So maybe you don't watch all the episodes, but you watch the first couple of seasons and then you don't watch the last two. And so you have to make sure you watch all the, the episodes and then make sure that you actually ingest the cinematic grammar. You have to do that because you've got to be able to talk to the filmmakers, to the rest of the crew, and you've got to talk about what that is, what you have to do in order to like achieve this stuff. Because you're in the house style, but you have to try to put your own spin on it, too. So you kind of understand what the show will tolerate. And by looking at the show over and over again, you'll see what they use and what they don't use. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to do this crazy long crane move and nobody's speaking, it won't get used. So I have to work within the house style to put my own imprints on it. So that's one thing you have to do your homework as a director. That's part of your homework is to take in the cinematic grammar of the piece uh, and all, all the actors as well, because the actors hit sometimes the, the similar notes and so maybe you'll put a different spin on it. You'll say, okay, well, why don't we do this? Or why don't we do that? You have to understand that these actors, they're like thoroughbred. They're all immensely talented, but they may be settled into a groove. They may be on the show for six, seven years. And you have to, as a director, come up with some fresh insights and challenge them as actors, as artists. Because, again, they may be on the show at the end of the seven or ten year run, then they're unemployed actors again, and they got to audition. I mean, not for all of them, because some of them, their profile has raised so that people are offering them stuff. But for the most part, everybody's auditioning again. And so you have to be true to that as artists. And sometimes some people are like, I don't like being directed. <laughs> you know, And I'm like, okay. For me, I compare myself to a coach. I used to play a lot of basketball. And so I compare myself to a coach because I'm really just reminding you where you are in space and time. And so emotionally, where you are, I'm, I'm reminding you emotionally where you are in space and time. And so as a matter of course, I'm like, okay, remember you're here, you just came out of this. And so this is where you are now. And you need to make this discovery in a scene. Let's see how you do that. Let's make that fresh. Let's make that something we haven't felt before. And let's listen to the other actor. And you're making the discovery. You haven't read the script. You're just, again, <laughs> making the discovery in the moment as the audience is. So these are some of the things that I do as a director slash coaching actors. But I think that that's how I approach it. And I like to keep it light on the set. Lots of humor. Lots of fun. It's hard with COVID because we have our masks and it's hard to tell a joke or be funny and the lower half of your face is not exposed. It's very hard to do that because we're on set, we're all in masks and sometimes a face shield. And then the actors are in masks when they're rehearsing, but when they're shooting, their masks are off. And again, we're tested three times a week. Sometimes we get tested every day. Some shows you get tested every day if you're in contact with the actors. That's like Amazon. So that's the Amazon money. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a massive adjustment going back to work with that framework of the COVID restrictions, meaning that you couldn't do certain things or that you had to stop and do testing and things like that. Obviously, it must be great just getting back to work in the middle of all this and doing it safely. But I can imagine it must be quite an adjustment to the schedule and everything else. It's an adjustment, but we have universal compliance. And the thing is, is that I was depressed like everybody else when I couldn't work. And I got lots of friends who can't work because they're in the food service industry or they have like an entertainment or venue space or what have you. But if you don't have an ability to go to work, that affects your mental health, that affects your ability to feed your family, feed yourself, all that stuff. So 
when we got the call to go back to work in September, it was fantastic. So the COVID restrictions that we had, you can't eat on set anymore. There's no craft trade. There's no food on set anymore. So you have to go to a designated area in a little cubicle and you can then take off your mask and then eat. But that social aspect that we all love so much about film and filmmaking, it's diminished. It's still there, but it's diminished and it's, it's a lot more controlled. But we all appreciate working. We really feel very lucky to be able to work. And everybody, it's like universal compliance. There's nobody like, I'm not an anti-masker or I'm, I'm exempt or I'll kind of, that doesn't happen because <laughs> everybody just wants to work and wants to pull through and we're all in this together. So it's a very much a camaraderie. And then as we go through this, we won't be out of masks until maybe next year, unless everybody's vaccinated. I don't know when we're going to be out of masks, but we're kind of in this together and we're all kind of in this war. And it's very much of a sense of camaraderie on the sets because everybody has to do it. Do you find it affects your preparation in terms of the time you might take to set up a scene or whatever? Do you find that it affects that in terms of having to put it together maybe more efficiently than you would before or a lot quicker than you would before or just differently? Absolutely. All of the above. You have to think about a lot more things. For example, the amount of extras in the scene, how the extras are going to be placed, how the extras are going to be in proximity to the actors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because we can't have, for example in this Legends of Tomorrow show that's coming up. I had to have somebody put a a hospital gown onto one of the characters, onto one of my actors. And it was like, I can't have the extra do it. I can't have the background performer do it. I have to have another actor do it who's in the red zone. I can't have an extra do it. Down to blocking, all of that stuff. And these people have to try to roughly put them six feet apart. These are some of the restrictions that we have to deal with. And you're always thinking about that because there's a COVID person on set. There's like 12 COVID people on the crew. There's a COVID person on the set monitoring all that stuff. On one of the sets, they have like a six foot sort of spear just to say, this is six feet, keep your distance. (laughs) (laughs) It's quite hilarious. We take it seriously, but you have to make additional plans for this. COVID has made everybody amateur scientists in terms of just keeping up to date on the science and the vaccines and all that kind of stuff. We all want to get through this, but we want to get through this safely because on sets, there haven't been outbreaks, but there have been people who brought it in and people who have passed away and been in the ICU. Absolutely. We're not exempt like in any other industry. As safe as we are, we're in a pandemic. Yeah, because I know that Flash and Superman got shut down and delayed because of positive tests and things. So, yeah, it is a very real threat. And I suppose you'll always be aware of that. And I think in terms of the actual episodes as they appear on screen, the only major difference I've actually noticed, so it's a testament to the, the work you guys do that I've barely noticed that anything's really different. But I've noticed on Supergirl in particular, there's a real focus on existing sets, the main cast, And that's about it. It's keeping it confined to those locations with those people with very few extras and and others. It's a necessary thing, I suppose. But that's the only difference I've really noticed. The other shows seem to be as broad as they ever were. Especially in Superman, there's a lot of scenes with multiple characters. I suppose a lot of that's outside, though, as well, which must help. I think that part of it is that Superman started up before the pandemic hit in terms of the pilot and everything. And then... They started back up again in the fall. Supergirl was kind of the first out of the gate. Like that was the first out of the gate. And they were extremely conservative. And it was about existing sets. We were finding our way. We're literally building the plane as we were flying it. That was my first job back as Supergirl. And so the thrust of it is that we had to be very, very conservative in the first days of Supergirl. As you go further on in Supergirl this season, you get bigger sets and different sets and they go out a bit and it expands. But we had to be extremely cautious because we didn't know what was going to happen. And in terms of even the testing, we had massive issues with testing in terms of not getting turnaround time fast enough. And so there were a lot of logistic hurdles to go through because you're just one industry amongst an economy. We're doing this weekly in the lower mainland of BC, where a lot of this filming takes place of all all of the Arrowverse and and the other shows that are there, like ABC and CBS and whatever. There's like 26,000 tests being done per week. That's like half the tests in the entire province. So the film industry is on top of this. We are really taking this very, very seriously. 
So it's a massive endeavor and it's incredibly expensive. Tests can be anywhere between 70 and $200. It's a lot of money to keep this thing going and also to keep everybody safe. So the shows definitely have a different look because that was the word. Everything that you said, existing sets, that was the meeting. (laughs) (laughs) Existing sets, not a lot of extras, core cast, going back to sort of the basics of the show. And it forced all the writers to dig deep to create drama within the core characters, core dynamics. One of the things I loved about the Supergirl episode that I did, there were some great, great moments between Rainy and, and Lena. Just some fantastic moments. And Supergirl actually she had a broken bone. She's never had an injury like that before. So it was great to see characters do things that they've never done before. And it does do the pandemic. There was the very real thing of Melissa had a baby. And, you know, she's a mom. She's a super mom. (laughs) And so she's on mat leave. So we had to actually write her out of scenes of the shooting. So that was a logistical hurdle. But it worked out because it was an opportunity to get her to do things that she'd never been forced to do before. That character had never had that happen to her before. A lot of the pandemic brought new opportunities to writers and to to actors and and to filmmakers. But it's still an adventure because they're still going through it. It's still tough. It is very clear with Kara in this season that they're keeping her in her own plot, I guess, for scheduling ease Mm -hmm. to work around her schedule. Was that scheduling difficulty for you filming your episode? You have to wait until the right time for... Melissa Benoist to come on set and then you've got obviously everybody else off doing their thing trying to get her back so that's the kind of two prongs I suppose was was that a challenge to work with oh absolutely absolutely anytime you have an actor who has been lucky enough to give birth you know a, a healthy birth where mom and baby are healthy it's a miracle obviously and it was great to see and everybody again on team Melissa so she's a great number one to have on set And everybody's really happy and overjoyed that she's back. But she was away during the time we initially filmed for 603, my episode. But it's necessity. Logistically, it is going to be a challenge. But everybody has to sort of, as long as the COVID thing, they have to do the same thing in terms of that particular person. If they're going to be away, everybody sort of pitches in and and makes it happen. The show has to go on. Of course. And it's a good opportunity as well, because it lets you explore what she means to people when she's not there and how she can inspire others in the place that she is as well. So for the final season, it's kind of good to get a summary of what she's about in this way by keeping her kind of separate. At least that's been my take on it. And I've I've found that interesting. Obviously I love seeing her interact with everybody because I think the strength of Supergirl is that character base. I think they're all brilliant. And I think there's lots of great dynamics there, but it's made the best of it. And I suppose that's what it is, is, is adapting to challenges and making the best of them rather than making excuses for them, I suppose. 100%. Because I think that you've got a great ensemble. The Super Friends are amazing. And it's, it's like you see, you know, if Michael Jordan's not there, everybody like Scotty's got to come on. Everybody has to you know, raise their A game up. And you've got fantastic, fantastic actors with great characters. And so they now have to do things that they normally wouldn't do if she's there to do an all the heavy lifting. So it's a great opportunity for the cast. But it, again, as you said, it makes us appreciate all the beauty and joy and amazingness that Melissa Benowitz brings to that character. You know, you kind of like take these things for granted because it's been on the air for five years. But you really like, this is gone. At the end of this, this is over. And we sort of just have to appreciate that and just enjoy this season. And they're able to end the series on their own accord. They're writing towards a conclusion. And it's a great, great cast, great crew. And they are really, really good at what they do. And what's the vibe like with it being the final season? How is everybody dealing with that? (laughs) It's interesting. I was on in the early part of it, so people were just really happy to work again. But they were kind of like looking around like at the end of this, because I think they're going to go to like August, I think. At the end of this, it's gone. It's gone. And they really appreciate it. It's a good vibe. I mean, they're a family, right? The crew and the cast have been around since shot one and day one. And so they've been around and they know each other and they're helping each other. There's a no assholes policy. So everybody's like, cool. But it's a generally kind of a wistful thing, but they just really appreciate every day. And the only sort of sad thing is that you can't really express yourself that much, but they do when they can. And and there's not that social thing. They're not going out and playing softball and, and all the other team things that they do. 
like the hockey teams that they have. They have hockey teams for all these shows, right? So it's like Arrow versus the Flash or, you know, <laughs> softball teams or whatever. It's crazy. Like, I mean, they have lots of fun. And unfortunately, they can't do that in the pandemic. But it makes you appreciate those things that much more. What is your directing style when you're on set? Are you more of a actor, director? Do you like to touch on everything? And is there kind of a thing you lean towards more than other things? I try to be an actor director, but I really like working with the crew. I like working and making really interesting shots, but they're telling the story. They're not just shots for the shots sake. And if I use this piece of special equipment, it's because myself and the director of photography have talked about every single shot and every single scene in the weeks that we have in preparation for this. So we get between seven and, and nine days to prepare an episode. And so I'll probably get this the script or an outline probably a month before I hit the ground. And so I'll be thinking about it and I'll do my visual research. So I have lots of visual references and I'll have a bunch of stuff to come at the director of photography with. And we'll talk about stuff up until the, and through shooting, but we'll talk about it. We'll have a meal, we'll you know sit down and just hash all this stuff out, especially the transitions. And just really try to be true to the language of the show, but also try to bring something new into it. I always ask the DOP, is there a piece of equipment or is there something that you've always wanted to try but never done? Or is there an angle at this particular set that you've never shot? It could be seven years you shot there. And I say, well, we've never shot this. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> mm, yeah, I can see why. We don't really need it. Or it's like, oh, there's an opportunity here. So, for example, in the flash, the first time I didn't get to shoot in the cortex. And that was like, what? I don't get to shoot the cortex? Man, I'm so upset. I'm like, really? I don't get a cortex scene? Oh, man. The only episode where it doesn't happen. <laughs> the only episode where it doesn't happen. Yeah. I'm like, really? You give me the, the cortex-free episode, really? And I didn't get to work with Carlos. I didn't get to work with Cisco the first time. And I was like, what? It was like, what? You give me this the stripped down episode? I was like, what? So anyway, I got to work with Carlos this time. It's a fantastic cast. They're just so good. And you take them for granted. We all take them for granted. They're so good. And they do it now at this point without even trying, but they've just sort of physically embodied the character for so long. But they're so amazing. And it's interesting because Grant is obviously matured. He's no longer sort of that boy-ish thing. But it's different because I, I understood that the show was a hit, but I didn't exactly know why. I like the show a lot. My family all watch the show. We all have seen every episode. I was like, I like this show. I don't exactly know why I love this show so much or why people love the show. After working with him, Candace Patton, the rest of the ensemble, I was like, okay, I get it now. There is a magic there and there's something that Grant does because he's unsure of himself. Not Grant, but Barry is unsure of himself. And Barry's Barry. Even though he's a Flash, he's still Barry. He's more Barry than a Flash. And that was the thing I always had with Superman and, and so much of the Henry Cavill. And we can get a debate later, but <laughs> um, <laughs> the Henry Cavill of it all. Clark is nothing to Henry Cavill, to Zack Snyder. They're not interested in Clark. Yeah. But Tyler Hawkland, Grant Gustin, that's Barry. That's Clark. These guys are trying to figure out their world. They're trying to figure out their stuff while they have all these superpowers. That's what I love about it, that I think that the Arrowverse shows get really, really right, is that they are about people who have these power as opposed to these gods, which is my complaint about the Snyderverse. No, I agree with you. I like the Snyder Cut. I did like the Snyder Cut. Me too. I hated the Whedonverse thing, man. I don't know what was going <laughs> on there. I really don't know. I have no idea what the hell that was. And that's one thing I love about watching these shows week to week. I think the Arrowverse really gets the comic book of it all right. But that was the first time I really sort of recognized what that magic was and why that particular show, why Flash is such a hit and as a, an enduring hit because there's a magic across the casting and across the writing that really sort of just looks at that sort of young adult thing. And as we're trying to figure out our way here, and superimposes, you know, Grodd and all this, <laughs> kill all these crazy, crazy beasts and the blood work and all the kind of crazy shit. It's got the young adult thing, 
but it, there's a magic there. Grant's such a fantastic dancer and singer. It's, I long for like another musical episode. And, and Melissa as well. Like, ah, uh, that was just uh, a dream. I love those episodes as a fan. Because that's the other thing is that if you can direct things that you're a fan of, you're going to bring another energy to it. I'm a fan of musical theater. I'm a fan of these type of shows. And you'll bring that kind of energy to it. So in terms of you asked, a question like my style, it's a high energy style. And I'm trying to find and trying to dig and find and mine those moments between characters that we kind of not gloss over, but if I can create some sort of authentic truth between these two characters, and again, the writers are giving it to us. If I can help the actors find that truth in that moment, it doesn't matter if you're talking about mix of click and you're on the Phantom Zone. It doesn't matter. But you could be talking to Batmite or whatever, right? It's like, this is truth between the two of you. And if I can grab that and then we see that, if the audience sees the actor believe it and what it means to that particular character, and if it's true, then we all buy into it. I strive to achieve that every scene, every shot, every take. So that's what I try to do. Yeah, and that thing you were talking about, the humanity of Superman, for example, that really comes across in the episode that you directed that was on this week, the moment where he's tested, where he wants to retaliate, where he's thinking about retaliating, but he's trained himself for his entire superhero career not to give in to that urge. And it's the tight close-ups, it's the red eyes, it's the look on his face, it's just that moment of humanity. It's like Superman is, he's a person here, he's tempted, but he's not going to do it, or is he going to do it? And then it's cut in with Jordan making the opposite choice which again punctuates it. And I thought that was a really brilliant moment. And you did a great job putting that together and getting the drama and that scene, the real human element there. Oh my gosh. That episode was so packed. I was so happy to get that script. I have to tell you, Tyler was so happy to to show that part of Superman, the angry Superman, angry Clark, because we'd never seen that before. The only time we'd seen that is, okay, Henry Cow is going to Zod. You know, he's <laughs> going to kill Zod or something. He's not going to do that. But it's just the restraint and all that stuff. And we were talking about the blocking of that particular scene in the underground, that lair, when the Department of Defense comes in. Just in terms of the blocking, Tyler was like, I really want to like just, I want to go up there. Like, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. He's like, okay, you don't think it's too much? No, 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 it's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Again, these are steps that this character really hasn't taken before. And I'm really happy that Todd Helbling and the rest of the creative team are like, yeah, let's go for it. Because everybody on the show, every, I don't care anybody in fandom has a relationship with Superman. Either you love the character or you hate the character or something. There's no ambivalent with Superman. Everybody has a relationship with Superman. Because a lot of us, that's our entry into fandom. Because that's what a comic book character means to us. That's from when we're children. We put a towel around our necks or whatever. <laughs> and I've got pictures of myself and my sister like that. So we all did it. We all pretended that we were Superman. We all pretended we could fly. So I asked Tyler, like, so how does uh, Superman fly? <laughs> Because <laughs> he had him in the harness and I, I had to ask him to fly a little faster. And we had a debate about how does Superman fly? How does he fly? Nobody has ever explained this shit to me. Like ever. <laughs> it's not like there's any method of propulsion. In the beginning, he could just leap like an eighth of yeah. a mile or whatever. He only was able to fly in 1941. And that's after the Fleischer cartoon. So there's always been that sort of, you know, sort of push and pull between the comic books and then the spinoff media where they'll sort of feed each other. Superman started flying in 1941, and then it was represented in the comic books. But that was all due to the cartoons. So it's like, mm. okay. Again, I didn't know that until having the conversation with Tyler. When like, we, we got into it, he seems to fly by pure thought. He flies faster than the speed of light by pure thought. And it's like, okay. I'm not going to ask about mitochondrial crystals or anything like that. We're like, okay, sure. He flies purely by thought. Supergirl flies, power girls, purely by thought. Any Kryptonian, that's how they do it. So great, no problem, (laughs) awesome. But it's crazy to think that that's how they can fly. I'm super happy that they can fly. But Tyler had to figure out how to fly faster, especially at the end when he's flying with his son. It's like, how do you fly and show the urgency? And it's all up here and he's feeling and thinking it. But it's like, okay. And when we did it, the first take, it was like, oh, okay, that's kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> but we had him up in the harness, so we did a couple more takes of it. But it was like, mm, you kind of got it right on the first take, dude. <laughs> that was the best thing I could even imagine. 
and we got some more stuff. And those flying stuff, it's very complex because there's a little green man. There's a man in a green suit. I don't know if you've seen any behind the scenes stuff, but there's a man in a little green suit and he's helping like when he needs to be guided so that it looks like he's controlling it with thought. And that's like Avengers, that's a standard thing. And that, that guy, in, he's a stunt rigger in a green suit, full green bodysuit and mask. And he's guiding the characters, usually by their foot or something. But you'll see that in the teardowns for all these big budgeted shows and stuff. And there's other things like a tuning fork. And there's all kinds of behind the scenes things of how one will do that and make it look real. But these are stunt riggers who have years of experience, like 20 years of experience, 30 years of experience. They're just artists. And working on a show like Superman or Supergirl, you're afforded that. And that's one of the reasons why I like doing genre work. My own work, I'm not able to you know, get budgets like that. And I don't generally have people fly in my own work. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. It's fantastic to have that opportunity. You're realizing your lifelong dream to be able to do this kind of stuff. And it's down to Tyler to make it look as effortless as walking. Yeah, you know, he's a fantastic Superman. For me, he's the best. Even Christopher Reeve, I think that Tyler is the best Superman. And I'll <laughs> argue anybody over a beer about that. Because if you go on Twitter, Cavill is the only Superman. Whatever, I'm like, there's been a lot of actors who play Superman. And I love all of them. But I think that Tyler has something unique to the time and what being a man is right now, how that's all under sort of reevaluation, being a husband, being a father in this point in time, he's just a, this distillation of what's going on in society. And so I think he's making some excellent, excellent choices. And I think he's a fabulous Superman. I was like, that's Superman, honestly. And he's also bulking up. So you obviously, you know, he's got a suit on, but he's bulking up. So they had to get rid of some of the padding because he's literally getting big. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked him in the role ever since he was introduced in Supergirl. I also think that Henry Cavill has a great Superman film in him. I think it's just, he just hasn't had the opportunity to play his version properly yet and probably never will at this rate. Bit of a shame in a way, but Tyler Hecklin, great Superman. Tom Welling was of his time and did a great job. Brandon Routh got to do it one last time. He was great too. <laughs> he was, I love that in the crossover. He is so good. And he was just in a bad movie. He was so good. I'm not a fan of Superman Returns, but Brandon Routh, I am a fan of. I think he's fabulous. And I was really happy that he got a chance to do it. To play the King to Come Superman in a crossover last year. Yeah, give him one last shot before he leaves Legends forever. Yeah, he's fantastic. But Henry Cavill, I hope he does get a chance to do it because he was fantastic. But I just felt that his Clark was underdeveloped and i just didn't think that he looked like a person who grew up in a small town who was kind of sane he looked like he was kind of a serial killer like in the beginning where he like stole the clothes and all that he just looked like a drifter and then that anger that he like twisted that truck around i'm like what the hell <laughs> jesus christ you're crazy dude oh my god you're just <laughs> scary you're a scary superman you're the scariest superman i've ever seen it's all the choices that Tyler's version wouldn't make, I suppose. No, I was like, just zing his ass with his, some heat vision. Like, I mean, I'll just do something. <laughs> like, I'm just like, really? The guy turns around. And I was like, wow, that's some violent ass stuff. Clark has some serious anger. I was like, whoa, that's super violent. <laughs> so I was like, that's kind of crazy. But also, I, I don't want to get into that movie. There were some good parts of that movie. But then there was some also some crazy, crazy stuff. And I'm like... This is not fun. This is not Superman. Superman doesn't kill. Put him in the Phantom Zone projector. Come on, dude. Don't just kill him. <laughs> Put him back in the Phantom Zone. Use your mind. Oh, I agree. It was interesting hearing about the technical side of flying. A technical question I really wanted to ask was, the recent Flash episode you did, you had scenes where Danielle Panabaker was playing against herself. <laughs> so how did you put those together? Because I'm convinced there's two of them. I really am, because she's so good at playing those two roles and in the same scene, and there's even group scenes where they're both in it. And I mean, I know how they do it because she'll be in one role for one shot and one role for another shot and stitch them together. But the scenes where she's playing against herself, how do you put them together and how do you direct them? Well, we are lucky to have two acting doubles. So the playing Caitlin and also playing Killer Frost, that we always have two acting doubles. So when Caitlin is playing Caitlin, we'll have acting over for Frost and vice versa. She'll lay down the track. And so we have to mirror that track. And we've got to actually 
take a good take of Caitlin, the one that we're going to use, and actually replay that so that the Killer Frost, when Caitlin is Killer Frost, she can play against herself. She's playing a recording of herself, but she's playing to a person who is sort of mimicking an action, the recording. So it's a very complicated thing. If you look at Orphan Black, for example, I don't know if you've ever followed that show, that was even more complicated. And we have to use a motion control camera and, and very, very technical. So it takes like all day. Danielle Pennebaker, just in terms of as an actor, is an incredible actor. She's also a director as well, but she's an incredible actor. She just killed it. She's so prepared. She knows all the lines. She knows all the emotions. She knows everything. She's just so super prepared. She's just giving her gusto every scene, every shot, every angle. And she's also a new mom. By the end of it, she's just spent. She sleeps well, as she says. She's just spent. And so you can't overdo it because at some point she was like suds do you really need another one because <laughs> <laughs> i'm knackered the thing is is that she's so good she makes it look easy and it's not it's very very difficult thing to do when you're playing against yourself because you're also thinking about it the thing is to get out of your head and just react to yourself essentially that's what she has to do we're very very lucky that we have talented acting doubles that can play opposite her and they've done it for a while. There's some fantastic scenes in that episode where she's just enacting tour de force. It was really a great thing to watch happen. And we created some stuff on the set, which was great as well. It's just some of the choices that she was making. And it's very, very good. Very, very good experience. And I think the episode turned out really well. Oh, yeah, I agree. It was a really good one. And I suppose there would have been some experience on the crew from Legends doing it with the two Zaris in the last season because they had some playing off each other scenes as well. Oh, yeah. And I was a skeptic of Zari 2.0, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> and I know everybody was, but I was, and, and uh, Tala was really a skeptic. But Zari 2.0 has grown on her. It's weird. She's just so stunning. So I was like, just like, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you get like, oh, my God. But she was not super supportive of that idea in the beginning. But it grew on her. This character, there's no end to it. The Zari 2.0. And there could be a Zari 3.0. I don't know if that's going to happen, but there's no end to it. Another fantastic actor. You kind of take this for granted because they're so good and they're now part of our family visually. You know, Legends, we just take them for granted, but they're really, really good. Really, really good. Yeah, you're going to enjoy the next episode of Legends. I enjoy every episode of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a delight. There's nothing else like it. It's incredible. Yeah. And I imagine helping to create that lunacy must be a blast as well. Oh my gosh, yeah. I want to hear what you think of the episodes that are upcoming and the whole season, because the whole season is just like crazy, crazy. <laughs> it is so good. And there's some stuff that you're going to see. Katie Lotz directed one at, that after me, and it's just bananas. So it's a great season. It's a great season of Legend coming up. And season seven has been announced, so I'm hoping to go back there. Yeah, they're just a fantastic bunch of human beings and great great writing such great writing <laughs> yeah there's nothing like it i refer to it sometimes as a workplace comedy that sometimes has superpowers in it <laughs> yeah, to be the best absolutely. way to describe it absolutely absolutely like they are so funny there's one moment where i said ass over tea cuddle which is not a very common North American expression. I guess it's more of a British expression. And they're such hams sometimes. And they all started to just do some crazy <laughs> improvised slow motion uh, silver tea kettle. They're such a delight. Like they're so funny as a group and as individuals. They're just funny people. It was a pleasure to work on that show. I was really enjoyed and laughed all day, every day. You must have had a similar challenge to Supergirl with. Katie Lott's being separated from the other yeah. characters as well with scheduling yeah. and stuff. Is there actually a reason for that? I mean, I don't know if you are allowed to tell me because it, it seems odd that she's away having her own plot. Is there a production reason for that? Well, for that particular point is that she was directing the one after my episode. So she couldn't be in that show so much. So they had to actually write her out of a few episodes. Right, okay. I can't say anymore, but that was the technical reason or the logistic reason. But it works out because they have reasons for this. They can generate reasons for this. And because she's gone, then that creates more space for other characters to rise up and fill the void and, and to see those new dynamics when things change. Because you'll see Rory, for example, take a step where he had never taken before. And that's not giving away too much in the episode that I directed. So you see that 
and you'll see things I can't say anymore. <laughs> you'll, see, <laughs> you'll see some interesting things that you haven't seen before on Legends because the dynamic has now changed. And it's great to see that. And as you say, it's unlike anything else on TV. Yeah, absolutely love it. It just brings me joy every time I watch it because it's that kind of show. So I'm looking forward to the next one. Your one is a Cuban Missile Crisis episode, according to the synopsis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're going to enjoy that. Yeah, so JFK is <laughs> in it and so on. I'm not going to say anymore. You're going to enjoy that. <laughs> I don't want to be spoiled. I would never ask people to reveal things or give me like upfront information about stuff because I don't want to know. I want to watch it and find out that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I want to find out. Honestly, man, it's a fun episode. It's crazy. I've never done anything like that before. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you'll get to again. Absolutely, absolutely. Some of the other work that you've done on your IMDb page, Utopia Falls stood out to me. That's a Joseph Malozzi show. Joseph Malozzi has actually been on this podcast before we oh, interviewed wicked, him wicked. a few years ago. And he's been a big supporter when we reviewed, it wasn't me that reviewed it, but when we reviewed Dark Matter and things, he was, you know, he's a very, very supportive guy. So what was it like working with him for you? And he's a director as well, but he's the showrunner on the show that you directed two episodes, was it? Yeah, he's fantastic. It was uh, created by a guy named R.T. Thorne, and he was the lead director on it and creator. And then Joe was the showrunner. It was great. It was fantastic working with those guys. Joe, he's cool. He likes a good scotch, and we would imbibe in the afternoon. Just a glass. <laughs> Just a glass. <laughs> he said a lot of different whiskeys. And it was just like, okay, that was great. Oh, that's a Japanese one. Okay, that's great. And he knows a lot about whiskey. I mean, he's a great writer. But I just have to say, the lasting memory I have is us just chilling, like gentlemen. And there were some ladies involved in the afternoon, at the end of the, the working day kind of thing. Just a moment. Just having a moment. And it was just like, this is great. I want to live my life like this. <laughs> so I look forward <laughs> to the next show I do for Joe Malozzi. <laughs> I've got a lot of time for him. Like I say, he's been a supporter of the podcast. When we did our 100th episode, I got people that had been interviewed in the past to kind of record a bit and he was willing to do it. So yeah, really supportive guy. He's very in touch with the fan community, I always find, with the shows that he works on. And that yeah, absolutely gives a bit extra, I think. I'm always appreciative of that sort of thing. Oh yeah, I can't wait till his next show. He's a fantastic writer. Yeah, for sure. And you also directed Kiefer Sutherland, a heavyweight in the industry. What was it like directing someone of that caliber? He's got all this weird thing where everybody was like, okay, you get this out of your bro's keeper. Kind of trying to scare me or whatever. I was trying to meet people where they are because Kiefer does not like a lot of noise on the set. So it's got to be quiet, right? Because sometimes you can like, okay, let's start on page two where we just like, you know, Kiefer's not like that at all. He's very much a musician. So he wants to start at the beginning. He's particular, right? He's got his particular stuff. But we just got on like a house on fire. I mean, my name is Sutherland as well. And ironically, I didn't meet him as a fan like a, a number of years ago. I met him and he was in New York. He was partying. He was part of championship season. He was in a play with Mark Sheen and a whole bunch of other heavyweights. And it was New York. I just brought my wife to the W Hotel anniversary surprise trip. And then we were going to the elevators at the end of the night. And then there's this elevator is open, but there's a security guy in front of the elevator not letting us in. Then I hear a voice behind the guy saying, it's okay, let them in. A security guy steps aside, and then it's Kiefer Sutherland alone in the elevator. At the end of a night, he parties, so he's feeling like no pain at all, of course. <laughs> so he's <laughs> swaying a little bit. And then so I go in there, my wife and I, and, and um, we go in. And I say, we're from Canada, we're fans. And then my wife says, oh, and his last name is Sutherland. And then... <laughs> Kiefer, without not a moment's hesitation, goes, brother! And it gives me a big hug and a big kiss. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Just brilliant. It was great working with him because you've never met a more prepared actor. He works with a dramaturge. as his personal assistant, and she's British. She's been a dramaturge for years, and she works with him on a script, and he knows everybody's lines. He is <laughs> a super trained actor. So he's super committed, and he brings that work ethic and that approach to everything he does he's obviously a very powerful musician as well he goes on tour all over the world and he's really very passionate about it i really enjoyed working with him because again he brings a full full commitment to every single thing he does and it raises everybody else's game so yeah it's pretty amazing opportunity to work with him so i was able to work with him for two episodes it was great and you, you said about his quirks around the set needs to be quiet or whatever do you find any of the out of verse actors had any quirks that you needed to compensate for as you were working with them no i think you got to be 
conscious of their time because they're on this show for like mm, nine months, 10 months almost. So you try to schedule them so that they're not at the top of the day and the end of the day. You try to put their stuff together and try to give them some days off so that they can rest and kind of have a life because it's a 10 month slog and they only have to get like two months off. You want to make sure that they're fresh. I try to do that as a strategy, as a way of conserving energy. And psychologically, I try to keep it all light and high energy and try to just direct our energies all in the same direction, if you get what I'm saying. So I think that those are the things. I don't think anybody has really sort of idiosyncrasies so much, but I just try to meet people where they are and not let any of the noise outside of this tell me about a person before I meet them myself. Because there's all kinds of stuff out there in the internet world. (laughs) I just ignore all, I try not to Google people. I just try to ask them questions about whatever and have like an organic conversation as opposed to, well, I saw on Wikipedia that you like (laughs) green horsed frogs or whatever. I don't know what that is, but uh, I discover things about actors because I do like talking to them. And I'm not a person who's afraid of talking to actors. I do like talking to them. Because I admire what they do. I think that it's just them out there. So I do admire what they do. And there's so much action on these shows as well. Is there any notable sequences? We already discussed the Superman wanting to go nuts, but not able to go nuts one. Is there any particular sequences that you loved putting together? And what's it like doing some of it, but knowing that the CGI will come in later. I know Kevin Smith talked about directing The Flash and anytime Barry speeds off, they do the, right, we've got to go. And it's high energy. And then he just kind of ambles off to be replaced with the lightning effect. Yeah, it's always like that. There's a sort of standard, okay, well, we do that and we'll do a little, we call that a fathwoom. And so anytime <laughs> he goes away or comes there, when he leaves, it's a fathwoom. And it's literally written like that, fathwoom. And then so you bring in the air gun or whatever, air blower, <laughs> people like oh you know <laughs> so they're kind of like okay it's seven years now i've been blasted in the face with an air gun okay sure whatever but i think that uh, all of that stuff you kind of get to know the literature of the show or the language of the show and i think that that's fun for the newcomer director but the rest of the cast they're done with that they're okay they're like okay let's just do this quickly all those things when you're putting like three quarters of it together It's great. Again, it's all part of knowing the show. So understanding that, okay, that background or the set extension will be like this up. And so everybody's got to look over here and give them a space to look at, give them a dot or or a tennis ball or something or an X to look at. Oh, that's the giant monster. Oh my gosh, here we go. (laughs) But they're all looking at the same thing. It's very important because you can't have one person like looking over here, one person over there, because that's going to obviously look insane. But I think that's all part of working with VFX. And it's a really team of, they're all really good. I've worked on super huge feature films like X-Men or any of the Supermans or whatever. They've worked on huge films and they bring that experience to, to the Arrowverse. Do you get a sort of temporary image of what the CGI thing is going to look like? Or is it, you don't really see the finished result until it airs? You get a temp for sure. And then in the editing process, it depends on how much you have to render. So in the editing process, you'll get a temp as well. But you don't see the finish finish generally until it airs. The turnaround on these things is pretty insane. It seems... It's kind of like a 10-week turnaround thing. So, yeah, that's kind of how it is. Is there any shows on television just now or that are coming up that you really want to direct that you're desperate to get in the director's seat for? Green Lantern. Just put it out there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hopefully. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a lot better than the movie. Even Ryan Reynolds is just joking about that stuff, but yeah. I'm really excited to see what's going on with that. What's coming next for you? What's coming up for you that you can talk about? Obviously, there'll be things you can, but what can you talk about? Next, I'm directing a documentary series. I'm producing a documentary series with Jennifer Holness, my partner. It's about Black history in Canada. We don't really have a lot of films or television about Black History in Canada. So we're going to be looking at the histories of Black folks in Canada. It's called Black, an origin story, BLK, an origin story. And so we'll be looking at from first contact, from like the first Black folks were there in like 1500s up until the present. It won't be like sort of a survey documentary. We're telling stories about Black folks in Canada, but it's by no means definitive. We're just sort of doing volume one. We'll be looking at four sites, which is Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. We'll look at the Black history in those regions, and then hopefully we'll get a a series two out of it, and then on and on and on. 
but that's what we're doing immediately next. And that'll be on air in February of 2022. Sounds like a very important piece of work to get out there and show people and all that stuff. So that sounds great. Yeah, well, we're crossing our fingers. We hope it turns out well. And we're doing some exciting genealogical research, both in Canada and the States. Also like Sierra Leone and Jamaica, it takes us all over the world. So it's going to be interesting. It does sound great. So the last question, since it's a nerdy podcast, I always ask, what superpower would you have and why, if you could have anyone? Oh, boy. (laughs) I always oscillate between super strength and super speed. I would like to be a speedster. But then again, I just think about the timeline and Flashpoint and all that stuff. I'm like, (laughs) oh, really? So, I mean, that, but the power of flight would be really cool. But I always have this thing with my kids, like, okay, you can have the power of flight, but you have to be either naked or you go really slowly or whatever. You know, there's always a drawback (laughs) when I give people superpowers. So I like the ability to move objects with my mind. Telekinesis would be another power. But then all these things could make you lazy and just bad, (laughs) make you a bad person. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Zapped. I have, yeah. Yeah, so there's the teenage boy of it all. That would be easy, and you just become evil. You just become like a little pervert. So I guess flight, I think that that would be the most fun. I think it really would be the most fun, but it would also questionable, how am I going to fly? Because again, method of propulsion. Because of all the characters, I think Iron Man is the most possible. I think Iron Man is possible. Have you seen Emily the Engineer? No, I haven't. She's a, a person, so it's just an Instagram account. She's made an Iron Man costume with everything. Like she just does a 3D mold, 3D prints, and it's fantastic. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's sponsored and everything. Emily, the engineer. Check out. Flight, yeah. I think flight. <laughs> it could be like in Chronicle where you use telekinesis to make yourself fly. That's something they did. Okay, that is true. Because I guess with an old telekinesis thing, how heavy would the object be? You know, reading like Firestarter or, or any of the Stephen King stuff with that power, for example, that the father has the pushing, like just mm-hmm. convincing somebody that, oh, this piece of paper is a $20 bill or a $100 bill. He had like a brain tumor as the cost of having this superpower. So I don't think you have these powers just because there's a cost to all these things. Yeah. So I don't know, man. Like I think flight was always the one. But again, I've given this a lot of thought over the years, maybe a bit too much thought of all the palette of superpowers, I would say flight or telekinesis, not in a perverted way. <laughs> in a noble way. <laughs> in a noble way. What about yourself? For me, it'd be speed. So then I could get everywhere quickly. I could write quickly, let my brain work at super speed. Just okay, I could cool. get everything done and then have time myself as well. Perfect for me, yeah. I think. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Speedster. Beware of Flashpoint. Beware of flashback. I wouldn't travel through time. Or if I would, it would just be to go to a concert or something like that that I would never oh, get to that. see otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who did a book called All Are Wrong Todays. It was probably one of the best books on time travel because really it was about love. But mm. because thinking about the universe as a, let's say it's a cube, the sun, it's got its own rotation, but the earth also has got its own rotation around the sun. In terms of we are at some point in the universe, how do we get to 1958, June 3rd in New York City on corner of Avenue B and 3rd Street? How do you get there? And you need a a location, a signature, so your time machine can actually get to that place and, and rematerialize you there. It solves that question. Because I think all time novels are bullshit without that location. Because plus the dimension of time, we're in a three-dimensional space. Because the Earth is not static. How do you know that you're not going to end up in a rock or in a, an ocean or three miles above the Earth's atmosphere? That's the question. In the middle of outer space. Or in the middle of outer space. You could wind up in the center of the moon, for God's sake. <laughs> so how do you do that? This novel actually solves it. It's a guy named Alain Mastai. Uh, all are wrong today. It's a fantastic, fantastic book, but it solves that problem beautifully, I think. I'll look it out. I love a good time travel novel. I'll definitely look that out. I'll take your recommendation. Okay, great. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's, it's been great chatting to you about all the stuff, some great insight into all the stuff that I watch and how it all works and how it's all put together. It's been amazing talking to you. I'm so glad you agreed to come on. Oh, no, thanks for having me on, Craig. It's been great. You're very welcome. Welcome on any time. Okay, excellent. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. 
Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. That was my chat with Suds Sutherland. I'd like to once again wish him all the best with his future projects. I really hope he succeeds in everything he's working on. If you like what you heard, then don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any major podcasting app. Apple users, please leave us a star rating and a review. If you want to discuss Superman and Lois, Supergirl, The Flash, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, any Arrowverse show, this interview, or anything else, then you can find us on Facebook and Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, I hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod.